Thank you, and you may be seated. I'll turn over to Pastor Larry. We'll have our message this morning. Okay, I think I'm on. Yes, we're on. We're going to be talking this morning about God's plan starts to fit together. Um, I might just give you a little background behind a series that I've been teaching to men since the start of February on if you think things are bad now, just wait, it gets worse. You know, that's, a, that's something that's really encouraging, isn't it? If you think things are bad now, just wait, it gets worse. Well, we started that in February. And everything was riding high. There were, everybody was working. Uh, the stock market was at its highest level ever. Everybody seemed to be uh, doing pretty good. I was still recuperating from my knee surgery, so... I was just, at the start of February, I was just getting back to having my men's meeting on Tuesday mornings and teaching them. And so the Lord led me to this. Actually, it was a series of messages that I delivered in Bay City in 1995. And uh, so I just took everything and redid it and added new stuff to it, and now it's in a computer and not in a soft-bound portfolio. And it, it seemed to fit back then, but as soon as I introduced it to the men, it clicked with them. And our little group that's, when, we got, when I got back to teaching the group, it had gone down to two from me being off so many months with my knee surgery. And then we added three and four, and I think we got up to five by the end of the month. And then at the start of March, we had to cut it out because we weren't allowed to meet. And we didn't meet again until whenever the churches came back over. What day was that? Anyway, and I said, the uh, title must have been a little prophetic for us because things did get worse. Things did get strange. And things got violent. And I thought, well, we, we come to a, a portion of Scripture and, um, and we realize while we're going through this that this is really applicable to today. Because the Bible even tells us that in 2 Timothy, the third chapter, Paul writes to Timothy and he says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. They will be covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, Incontinent, fierce despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, and having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. For as this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive women laden with sins, lest uh, led away with divers lust, ever learning, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now here we go. 
now as Janus and Jambres withstood who? Just as Janus and Jambres from the Egyptian court withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds, reprobate concerning the faith. But they shall proceed no further in their folly, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men as theirs was. And so we have a New Testament connection to Moses' purpose and battle when he went back to Egypt of the plagues and uh, the process of getting back into Egypt, God's plan starting to fit together, and these people are being moved and used. And, and when uh, Moses comes to Pharaoh's court, and the plagues are going to come upon Egypt, the Egyptian magicians were able to duplicate some of that. And that was Janus and Jambres. And so God is comparing the Egyptian account, or this account of Moses leading the children of Israel out of Egypt. He's really give us a picture of of this day, the last days. I believe we're living in the last days. If they're not the last days, we can see them from here. Many things that have happened recently have given us reason to believe more and more that the Scriptures are unfolding every day as we get up and we see the news and things that are happening. And you think, oh my, this could be the day the Lord would return. This could be the day. And so Moses, here in this chapter, fourth chapter, a lot of it's happened already, but Moses is returning to Egypt. And Frank uh, read up through verse 24. It says, it came to pass, by the way, at the end that the Lord met him and sought to kill him. And why would the Lord meet and seek to kill the man who he had called to the task? And this is why. Verse 25. Then Zipporah, which was his wife, took a sharp stone and cut off the foreskin of her son, and cast it at his feet. He said, Surely a bloody husband thou art to me. Um, Zipporah, Moses' wife, takes things into her own hands, and it seems very confusing that out of all the stuff that is happening, all of a sudden this verse happens, and why did they put that story in there? <laughs> What's with that? Kind of like what happened with us. We're going along and things are really moving pretty good. And at the first of March, it's like, boom. We have to wear masks and we can't come to church. What happened with that? It didn't make sense. It, it was very messy, this COVID thing. And frankly, when the COVID thing first came out, I got the picture in my mind and my heart from God's Word that it's related to um, it's related to the Lord's table. The improper observance of, the, of communion over the years and years. Uh, anyway, I won't, I won't go there any further, but that's, what, that's way, the way I interpret it. But uh, unless you read Genesis 17, 14, you don't really catch what's going on here. It's just all of a sudden happens and most people just gloss over it. So let's look at it for just a second. It says, Genesis 17, 14, And as for any uncircumcised male who has not circumcised the flesh of his foreskin, that person shall be cut off from his people. 
He has broken my covenant. Broken covenants. The Lord was going to kill Moses at the campsite by the inn because he had neglected to identify his son with God's chosen people. The people of circumcision were going to be rescued by a man who didn't even circumcise his own son. Okay. People who don't practice what they preach. His son was uncircumcised, so thereby the son was cut off from the chosen people. Moses had broken the covenant even before he started because of this unfinished task. Something had not been done that he was supposed to do. Now, I I titled this particular study, A Little Bird Told Me, because that's the name of Zipporah. That means it's a little bird and delivers the message that she did not appreciate having to circumcise her son herself. But she may have been the one who opposed it in the first place. But now she sees the necessity of it to save her husband's life and to keep her son from being cut off from God's promise to Abraham. Throwing the foreskin at uh, Moses' feet, uh, it's probably symbolic, But God healed this prophet and deliverer. He gets back on track. And so this is an act of faith on Zipporah's part. And very impressive. Because she was not raised in the Hebrew culture that was in Egypt. And that's where the Hebrew culture was at. The Hebrew culture was not in Israel. They hadn't gotten there yet. The Hebrew culture had moved all the way to Egypt. Then that's where it was at. And they're coming out of Egypt. They're going to be coming out with about two and a half million, three million people out of Egypt and wander through the desert for 40 years. That's going to happen here. So this was a woman who had uh, was going to leave the comforts of her family and she was going to make her son uh, a member of the circumcision. And... Uh, follow her husband because you know she had to follow her husband because he had been out talking to a bush somewhere makes sense doesn't it yeah it does and so praise god she was willing to help even though moses had dropped the ball mama won this theological argument the story gets rolling as nothing has happened now see zipporah was a midianite it's in northwest Arabia, the Arabian Peninsula by the Red Sea. It's on the other side of the Red Sea next to Egypt. So let's say Egypt is here and the Red Sea is here and Midian is on this side. So it's kind of next door, but they're not going to pass through Midian until they get to the Red Sea. Joseph, who was he sold to by his brothers? his brother sold Joseph into Egypt, he was sold to Midianites. Midian, uh, the name alone, uh, talks about a place of judgment. It was one of the um, it was one of the the six sons of uh, um, Well, the Midian, he was a son of Abraham and Keturah. Abraham and Keturah depends on who you talk to or who you read in commentaries. They had either five or six sons. And, uh, and so that's who Midian was. Uh, so at the end of 40 years of uh, wandering, Midian and Moab tried to exterminate the Jews. And so we look at all of these strange heathen culture people in Moses' background. But isn't that like what we are today? We have all kinds of cultures, strange 
people in our background, right? We have unbelievers in our background. We have believers in our background. There's all kinds of people. It's, it's probably no different today than it was back then. Is that you have believers around you, you have unbelievers around you. And Zipporah was probably raised in, even though her father was priest of Midian, he was a priest amongst a heathen culture. And what is he a priest of? I don't think it says that he was, what he was a priest of. So here she is completely out of her comfort zone and standing in the gap between God and Moses. And then she exits the scene. Um, Exodus 18, 2-3, it says, When Jethro, priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law, heard of all that God had done for Moses, and for Israel his people, and that the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt, then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took Zipporah, Moses' wife, after he had sent her back and her two sons, of which the name was Gershom, he said, For I've been an alien in a strange land. So it's at the uh, at some point in time, she has left Moses and gone home with the kids so that he can take care of things in Egypt. So now that's where we're at. And now, the Lord, in uh, the next verse, speaks to Aaron. Here in the fourth chapter. It says, And the Lord said to Aaron, Go into the wilderness and meet Moses. And he went and met him in the mount of God and kissed him. And Moses told Aaron all the words of the Lord who had sent him and all the signs which he had commanded him. And Moses and Aaron went and gathered together all the elders of the children of Israel. And Aaron spoke all the words which the Lord had spoken unto Moses and did the signs in the sight of the people. And the people believed. And when they had heard the Lord, they visit, had visited the children of Israel, and that He had looked upon their affliction, then they bowed their heads and worshipped. And so Aaron and Moses are reunited. Verses 27 and 28. The Lord speaks to Aaron to go meet his brother. The two are reunited. This is after 40 years. Quite a headline, actually, in the life of anybody. If it happens today, it would be all over Facebook. Brothers reunited. TV5 would probably send out a camera crew. Brothers reunited after 40 years. Um, they used to call this a Kodak moment. This is one of those easy places that, where it's also easy to read over. It says these brothers kissed. You know, it would have to be my brother for me to kiss another man, believe me. <laughs> but they, even after 40 years, they were affectionate to each other. They got to know each other. Amazing how trusting Aaron is of Moses. He doesn't even question a word of his remarkable story. So God picks the right kind of support people. Or so it seems as we find out there is some doubt in Aaron's mind later on when Moses goes up into the mount and Aaron makes a, an idol of a cow for the people to worship and things get out of hand, but we're not going to go there right now any further. Moses tells Aaron the plans God has through the coming signs they've been given to get Israel out of Egypt Miracles are performed and they did the signs in the sight of the people and the people believed. These miracles were just the thing for an unbelieving crowd. Things looked pretty good for deliverance. Let's get this show on the road. But wait. <laughs> it's going to get worse before it gets better. And I think if you, you just 
stop for a minute and think about that, that last verse in there. The people believed. And when they had heard that the Lord had visited the children of Israel and that He had looked upon their affliction, they bowed their heads and worshipped. Four hundred years. Now, not all the four hundred years had been in slavery. It was after Joseph's generation, after the generation of Joseph's children, after the current pharaohs passed away, and after years had lapsed, Israel became slaves. But God is rehearsing all of this before them. And He's rehearsing it for us today in the middle of a time when we feel we need deliverance. There's evil all around. We don't know what story to believe anymore when we listen to the news. We don't know who's telling the truth. And if our religious leaders and our pulpits don't tell the truth, then what can we believe? And if you think that every church is telling the truth, and that every church is full of believers, that's probably not true either. There's a lot of places that gloss over the difficult stuff. The stuff you need to hear. I need to hear. The Lord understands your brokenness and your hurting life, your hurting people. And now it says, Israel believed. The Lord understands our hardness of heart. And He's taking steps to soften it. And those, some of those steps started back in March when things started going away. And we started noticing, you know what? We could do without a lot of that stuff. And we had a, ch a chance to sit down. I got a chance to meet so many people in my neighborhood I can't remember all their names now. Of course, they can tell me one moment what their name is and I can walk away and I can't remember the next no moment what their names are. But I've been... I've been learning my neighbor's names from walking around the neighborhood that started when we were bound up in our homes. Softening my heart. So God is taking steps to soften hardness. It's not God's hardness of approach, but it's our hearts. As long as you are drawing breath, it's not too late to soften your attitude about the Lord Jesus Christ, God the Father, the Holy Spirit, the Word of God, as they all witness to the fact that now is the time. Today is the day of salvation. They've had the veil lifted off their unbelief as God reveals Himself to them in His caring and understanding and loving manner. They believed because they had heard that God was concerned about them. And that He was going to do miraculous, great and mighty things and go to great and mighty lengths to get them out of Egypt, their suffering. And by the way, the, the, the time, the affliction in Egypt, it, it's it's, it, it is reflective of different areas. It's reflective of suffering emaciation, which is not enough food, uh, wretchedness, horrible conditions, dirty, and humiliating affliction. So not just hurting, but humiliating. That's what the time in Egypt had become. All of those terms are connected to affliction. There's even a sense of violence that they lived under. So all of this had 
become a tipping point to belief from unbelief where they had been. So they believed, that means before that, they had not believed. They had been complaining that this was not good, we need to get out of here, but all of a sudden they believed, oh, God can do this. So, the antidote for all of the unbelief was worship. And God's message to them. If you want to turn around a wasted, wretched, humiliating time of suffering, then now's the time to bow the knee. Your head and your heart to our Deliverer. This is the time. But you know what? We may never get everybody back to church. But does that stop us? No. We keep moving on. Moving from darkness into light. From neglect unto care. From wretchedness unto comfort. From suffering into healing. From humiliation into honor. From neglect into care. Uh, from barrenness unto the miraculous. And from affliction to relief and consolation. These are all descriptive of how a person goes from hopelessness to hope. From doubt to belief. The Lord loves to let you know that you're just as important to Him now. Or whatever state you may be in. Just as if you were seated in heaven with Him at this moment. And really, according to the book of Ephesians, you are seated there already. You're already in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So the Lord Jesus reveals Himself to us, and He does through His Word and prayer and through worship. His desire is that we act in belief and not turn away. See, a lot of, a lot of our culture has been discouraged about religion. They've been discouraged about the Bible and about the Savior And instead of looking inside of themselves, they turn away. But instead of dealing with the discouragement in a spiritual sort of fashion and getting encouraged once again, they could act in belief and come back. I'm not saying that people who stay away are unbelievers. I'm not saying that at all. I know there's valid reasons for people staying away. That's not about this. This is about people who have turned away completely. People who today have no thought of giving any idea of any honor to the Lord Jesus Christ in His day of the week. Now, you know, this used to be whose day? Sunday is what day? It is the, the Lord's day. But if you leave from here and go someplace else, you'll find out it's a lot of other days too now. It's not just the Lord's Day. It's the soccer day. It's the baseball competition day. It's everything but the Lord's Day. People have turned away. And you know what? God took a lot of that stuff away, didn't He? And why did He do that? He's trying to get our attention. A lot of people blame all of that stuff on, oh, this happened to a crazy governor and all, you know, all these politicians. They did all of this to us. And they complain and they complain and God's, God's saying, no, no. You did it. 
But instead of drawing up close to Him, they have turned away. Today, I think, you know, one of the things we can do right now is uh, remember that God calls and puts His people into service. And He gives them and He gives them the opportunity to use the tools that they have with them. Or they might not have seemingly have any tools or even talents or abilities. All Moses had was a, a rod. He didn't have any confidence in his speaking ability. He just knew that God wanted him to do this. And God says, you need to talk to Pharaoh about this. He says, I can't do that. Yes, you can. I can't do it, God. Okay, we're going to use your brother. And Zipporah. When came time for her to stand in the place that was between God and Moses, when she stood in between Moses and God, what did she rescue Moses with? She rescued him with a stone. She cut off the foreskin of her son with a stone. I'm glad I wasn't there. <laughs> I'm glad I wasn't the son. A stone. Now, I, I have never felt a stone that sharp. You know, I felt sharp knives. I bled from sharp knives or sharp edges. But if you want to get a good edge on a knife or something, make something real sharp, what do you put to the edge? You put a stone to it. And you keep moving that over the edge and moving that over the edge. So all she had to stand between God and her husband was a stone. You would have thought it would have been much more miraculous than that. But it wasn't. When God calls us, take with you what you have and let Him use that. Take your abilities with you. Let Him use them. There are talents that are built right in to our lives. And some of them have been honed to a real fine edge that is a tool for His glory. So, even a stone can be a preferred method. Not to throw through somebody's window or break something down. Maybe the stone can be a rock to sit on or a place to rest, your head, or whatever. The hurdles of today have crimped the way that we have been able to move about and use our talents. We have been literally stopped in our tracks and have to go back to using well, what do we have? What do we have in our homes? And thinking about it. We have not been able to move about, but the talents and the tools that God has gifted us with may be just the thing, may be just the thing that God will use as He leads uh, a person or a people back into the realm of belief and worship. Taking you from here to there. Sometimes all it takes is taking somebody with you. You know, my Bible study started growing when what happened? Well, when we started studying this passage, but it's when I started picking up people. And I take two guys with me. 
And it's amazing how that happened. And somebody might say, oh yeah, but think of all that gas you have to use and all this and that. And you got to get up earlier and you got to do this. And it's what I have. You know, I, I can use my car to God's glory. This is the day of things starting to fall into place. That's what this is. It's the start of God's plan. And you're right on the edge of it. You are ready to step in to another level of understanding and belief. Because if you look at it right, you'll have a renewed trust in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Your trust is not in the man. It's not in Moses. But it's in the Savior, Jesus Christ. And that's who Moses was, was serving, really. Jesus said, they saw my day. And they were glad. They were extremely happy to see my day coming. And you know what? He's coming to our rescue today. Right where we're at, He wants to come and, and help you. Your, he understands the pain. He understands your confusion. He understands your frustration and suffering and humiliation. And He understands our wasted years. And if you think I never had any wasted years, you're wrong. I had wasted years. But He used them. He used those wasted years of staying away too long in a land where I didn't belong. So God is saying, if you're stuck, start your journey today. Bow down to Him and worship. And believe that His plan is unfolding again in your life. Let's pray. Father, and we're in heaven, we're so grateful for everything that you have done for us. We don't want to be ungrateful in any way. We don't want to complain. But we do come and ask that you would touch our hearts that are hurting. And we just want to believe. And we know that you have our best interest at heart, but it seems like nobody around us even cares. But we care. And we know that you do too, and that you would wrap your loving arms around each person here and tell them that you love them deeply and that you have great plans for them. And so, Lord, we, we look to you today with great hope because we know of your soon coming. Great hope, blessed hope, and glorious appearing of our Lord and Savior. So, so, Lord, we just commit this day to you and the Word of God applied to our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.